Hello, seekers of Jesus. This is Rami Simeon, Romwald Simeon, the author of this book, Love Letters from Your Father. Actually, this is the Lexa Divina, 943 pages of the 21 chapters of John's Gospel. And it's Lexa Divina. We have the Bible and the explanation of all in the text and the, the scenario of what Jesus probably said from all the commentaries and uh, fathers of the church and all in one book. And in this, we can learn how to connect to Jesus Christ and in connecting to him, how to connect to the Father, how to connect back to yourself how to use his words and his letters that he writes to you from the Father and get your responses. So let's continue that. I'm giving you in these videos, I'm giving you a sample of it and saying how in each chapter, I break it down now to give you explanation. Those are not the actual words in the scripture, the, not, not the actual text, it's much more voluminous, but I'll give you a prelude of how it can be, how it can be used, and how you ha have the, uh, how to make the connection and connect talk with Jesus Christ and how he connects to you. And I give you a, a sample of it. Right now, we are in chapter 16 verses 7 to 15 and the first thing that the Lord is saying here to the apostles is that after the bad news that I explained to you before of what's going to happen not in detail but it's going it's going to be bad news first the redemption, the fulfillment of God's plan for man, and how to restore man's relationship to the Father, humanity's relationship to the Father, cutting through the rebellion of humans and their subjecting themselves and uh, taking precedence over God's word by following Satan's rebellion and how they continue to do this how the human race continues to do this it's called idolatry not thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven but how man's done is begot, be, uh, to be done on earth and that makes human heaven ignoring the existence of God, ignoring the reality of the fact that man is immortal and he will have to give an account of what he does in life. It's a test. This is a test time. This is not life. You say, well, this is how I make my life. You know, you read an obituary of someone that dies and they tell you all the different things that happened when they were born, where they went to school, how they developed their family, what were, what were their interests in life, and then they tell you, oh, what did they accomplish, you know, and some didn't accomplish hardly anything. One obituary had to pray for the soul of that person because all that he accomplished was that he played a good dart game in the tavern and he was a, a champion dart player. Then you read another obituary and you see a person with a very complete life as they not only use their life for enjoyment, not just to make a sort of a living for themselves, but how they were heroic throughout their life. The other one tells how he went into the army, went into the Air Force, 
was involved in so many exploits, so many dangerous exploits, the, the worst situations, and accomplished so much. And then when he came back, he bettered himself and got some kind of a career where he could help people and did this all his life in the society and in church and in everything he could involve himself in until a death, of course, we all come to the end, death, and at least you write that last page of your life on earth and it had, had better be a good page, it had to be something positive. If you end up with a negative, where you are some sort of thumb in your name at God as you die, then it's very sad, very sad. They'll pray for your soul and place yourself in the hands of God, but it's, it's very upsetting and we have many doubts. We don't want that to happen in our life. So let's come to this point of John 16, 7 to, verses 7 to 15. Jesus is now telling the apostles, well, I told you the bad news first about how I'm going to be killed. I'm going to leave you. You're going to be not only upset, you're going to be scattered as lambs from the pasture in the wolves will take over. This is a time of darkness. But I'm going to tell you now the good part. It's very wonderful when you have a certainty of good news after the bad. Because when you're in the bad first, you think it's never going to end. So Jesus is telling them something in a different way than normal human beings, as a prophet, as one who sees the future and knows the future. So he says, Good Friday, this is a good Friday. You're going to kill me. You will all be dispersed. You, you won't even doubt whether or not I'm the Messiah or not. The worst things can happen. But hang in there. Listen to me. It's good news too. Even the when you see things with the eyes of men and see the horrible tragedies that are going to occur this very day. This very day. And you'll say, Dee, I wish they didn't happen. I wish it wouldn't happen. But it has to happen because what I'm doing now is to overpower Satan, reverse it, redeem you, pay the price, and, let, and show you what it costs, what your sins cost. What you, what, I'm going to take on myself what you deserve, and I'm going to save you from it. So, even in the midst of this disaster you're going to see, good will come out of it. And there is good in it. As a divinity, as God, I didn't come here to do any evil. And even what seems to be evil, I bring good out of it. Remember that. But it is Good Friday. So do not be troubled because what I'm going through now, we're approaching the gate of a new era. This is the moment of truth. It'll take a while before you understand it. Even the good. Because you see with the eyes of men. But if you see with the eyes of the Spirit, we just see with my eyes what I see and foresee. You see with the eyes 
of the Father who is not here to do evil to us, not here to even allow evil. Because this so-called evil and this evil, it's as evil as it is. It's the worst that Satan can do. It's worse that men can do. But that evil will not succeed. There will be victory. Because this is the price I have to pay for creating the kingdom of God even on earth. The kingdom of God, our connection, our unification, your salvation is now in operation. You have a place in it and you will see it's like nothing ever before. You're always asking as apostles, am I what am I going to be in the kingdom of God? But the kingdom of God is not just a word. It's not just an expression. I'm telling you what it is. Now, even all that I tell you now, you do not completely understand. Especially now when you're coming to today, to see the bad part, the turmoil, the time of tribulation, the time when we are allowing Satan and humanity to do its worst. That will not last long. But it will look to you, looking with the eyes of men, it will say, this is the end. Don't say that. I assure you, it's not the end. If it were the end, I would tell you. It is not the end. It's the end of the end of Ma Satan's domination over men. But it's the beginning of a new beginning. Of a new era. Now, I'm going to explain it to you, and you won't understand it, but in a little while, you'll begin to understand it. Because in a little while, I'm going to return to you. The sadness that you have this day will be overcome you'll have some joy. But don't think that you're going to understand it completely. Because I'm going to tell you now, the good news is the best you have ever understood. You could ever expect outside of actually eternally coming to, into your eternal reward in heaven. This is the best that it can be. So astounding that after your joy, it's going to take you almost 40 days before you understand it in essence. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. Those are simple words. He can't come to you unless I merit it for you. I would not come to you unless the Father planned it and gave it as a free gift. You didn't merit redemption. It's a free gift solely out of the love of God.
the one who created you didn't want you to be a broken culture broken disaster a form of being I wanted you to be a little less than the angels that's what he wanted and he put you to the test you failed that test and now as a free gift he sends me to you to pay the price that you cannot pay. And now I'm going to tell you what I am going to do for you. I'm going to give you a gift you could not receive by yourself. I'm going to merit the Holy Spirit for you. Yes? You're going to be reborn in me. You become a new generation because I am the new Adam. You are going to be recreated. Recreated. You know, when you're reborn in the sense that John the Baptist was telling you to be reborn, to deliberately and vocally cast off your sins and follow the way of the Lord not the way of Satan but it's so difficult even when you do that you come up from it back you are with concupiscence seven capital sins uncertain claiming that you're uncertain so stupid <laughs> really so stupid You know, there is a dis distinction between stupidity and ignorance. You're ignorant now because I'm teaching you. I'm telling you things you did not know, but asking you to trust me and absorb it and learn what you don't know. But if you resist it, and ignore the main theme that I'm telling you and see these events only in the ways that human beings see them with their eyes and inferior knowledge and their attitude that if they see something small it's fully true you know it's only the beginning of something Let it unravel. Let it open up to you. It'll take you at least 40 days before you get a enlightened revelation, an enlightened understanding of what it's all about. So let me instruct you on this. You not only would get a new life, a new life. You didn't have a life with me in it before. The Messiah, I give you a new life. You're reborn in a new image. But I'm going to give you and merit for you something even more. A spirit, a spirit soul, a new type of soul, where the spirit of God will come into you. What I'm saying here is something that is so astounding. It's very difficult for you to absorb, but go on with it and it will work. Follow it step by step, phase by phase. 
and you'll be enlightened and become really new men. See? You will be prophets of God? Yes. You will be witness of God? Yes. You will be godly in imaging me in all aspects of my connection to humanity. You'll be an image of me. The times that are rough, the times when Satan will attack, times when Satan will convince you in a human way that he is in control of existence. No. He's in control of the negative things of the world, of the vices. He will dangle them in front of you as things that are so attractive, so satisfying. But he will pull them away from you in order to bring you to equal diabolical imaging self-destruction. This is mind-boggling. You have to meditate on it and absorb it step by step. And the Father will ultimately is saying that he doesn't see you simply as his creatures anymore. He will see creatures that are his children because the image of the Son of God is on you. The image of how he passed on himself into the hum humanness that he had and how that will connect to you. And your humanness will be all accepted and your humanness will be that people will look at you and see me. They won't see you, they'll see me. So when I send you the Holy Spirit, there will be three stages. Send the Holy Spirit, and let's say, what is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit are attitudes and action. Their response. Fearless, unrelenting, vital power. The power of life it says as the Spirit breathes on when man was created, breathe on him life. A life that was different from the life of animals, of creatures, of vegetation. And that life is to be a mover, a motor. It's essential, a predominant mode. And that life will be seen. If you don't have the spirit, people can't see divine action. If you have the spirit of God, as I have, It will always be seen. It's never unseen. So if you say, oh, I have the Spirit of God, but nobody can see it, because it's not obvious, it's not active, it's not responding, it doesn't accomplish anything, it's fearful. It holds back. So, when you have this first stage, when I send you 
my spirit. I said, the spirit, but remember I'm connected. I am a Holy Spirit. I am God's Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is connected to me and I'm connected to the Holy Spirit. So what I do will become yours. You'll respond and imitate me. And you will do it fearlessly, unrelentingly, not looking in your own humanness and saying, oh, I can't accomplish this. Oh, this is too much. Oh, I don't know what the Father's telling me. The Father's telling you to unite to the Holy, to the Trinity. People will see me in you by your actions, from the actions that you do, and the courage by which you do it. So as you look at what I go through today, never give up and never give in attitude. You can't do that without the Holy Spirit. So, there's the second stage. I will be reborn I mean, you will be reborn in me. I will give you new rebirth. The Father will be closer to you because you will have my attitude and my soul. You'll be like united to my human nature. Your human nature will be united to mine. And notice that when people have now in, as you look around and you call people saints, from the apostles and all the different saints that canonized saints, you notice one thing, no matter what they look like, no matter what they look like, no matter what circumstances they are in, no matter what culture they are in, their actions show my spirit. They all do the same actions, the same actions in different situations. That's how I relive through you. Each person has to bring divine action into the humanized, secularized culture in which you live. You look around and all say, oh my, this is a terrible life. This is a terrible situation. People don't trust each other. People lie. People hate. All the opposite virtues have to be relived by you. So all the, all the children, all my saints, all look like me. And looking like me, they're doing the will of the Father. Third stage, so much so that the Father will act towards you as he does act towards me. What do we when we talk about the Father God and the anthropomorph anthropomorphic way, we think of God as a human being. You cannot go think about God as a human being. That's an old man sitting on a throne watching you and supervising you and condemning you. That is not the image of God of the Father because he loves you. He's always seeking you. 
He sent me to seek you. And he sent you to seek others. So you see the Father himself as being close and connecting to him. And when you see him, you will not say, Master, powerful one, Allah, one that we have to fear. You have connection to him as Father, the super Father, the real Father that fathers even on earth should imitate and must imitate to be Father. You'll not fear to check with him daily, momentarily, in every need. You'll not fear to accept his instruction. His instruction, he gave him the Ten Commandments. Basic. His instruction that he gives you through the prophets. His instructions that you give through me. And through the prophets and through the apostles that speak of me, in me, by me. And you will never say, I don't know what God the Father expects of me. I'm telling you what he expected of me. He expected of me to do his will no matter what. Faithfully. And just trust that it'll all come out right. You don't have to see it come out right. You don't have that kind of knowledge. You can't look into the future. It's not part of your ability. So, you'll never say, I don't know what God wants me to do. I'll do what he wants me to do. But I don't know what he wants me to do. That's a cop-out. That is a cop-out. Observe me, and you'll know what the Father wants you to do. Listen to his Holy Spirit, and he will inspire you. Even against people that give you bad advice. He'll inspire you to do the right thing. And the Father will respond to you. He'll respond to you. See? Well, I call on the Father, he doesn't answer me. Well, you call him the Father as being your Father, as being God, not as being Santa Claus, and he responds. He holds you in the palm of his hand. Not only that, trust he will give you the reward. The reward is he can't cast you away. If you're like him and like the Son and listen to the Holy Spirit, but if you don't act on anything, what are you doing? You're not even giving the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit any response. You're not learning. Learning just doesn't mean to say, oh, that's good teaching. Learning is beyond just hearing. It's by listening and acting on what you learn. If you don't apply it and don't accomplish it, what have you learned? You want to go and take an exam and answer questions and sign your name to it? Yet nothing of it is in your life. Nothing of that reflects your life only reflects what you learned. What you think you know. You don't really know what you know or say you know unless it's applied. Unless it's used. He 
If you learn it, you can teach it in action. You don't have to have fancy words. You just have to have acts that correspond to what you learn. Little example. Say, I love everybody. I have no prejudices. Well, look into your actions. No prejudices. You have no prejudices. So what have you done for your neighbor? Have you accepted your neighbor as being your neighbor? Not only the question of listening to, to their troubles, but doing something about it, giving a good example at least, showing what you have done. Rebirth is not just dying to sin, but arising to life. Not just dying to sin. So the soul of the person, I give an example for myself, not to brag, but just what the Lord inspired me to do. The one that I read an obituary, and I do read obituaries. I look to see if they're going to be buried from a church, if there's someone's going to bless them, or if someone's just going to say, he was a good guy, he made us laugh. Oh yeah, he made mistakes. They don't tell don't know how many mistakes he made, if he wallowed in them or ended up in them. So when I read the obituary of the person who says everything he did in life was that he won dark games in a saloon. I say to myself, I don't know this man, never met him. But just what I read here, what they put in as his great accomplishment in life, I'm concerned. So I put him in prayer. Had a Mass offered for him. When I went to Mass, I called on the Lord to say, Lord, have mercy on this man. Don't even know if he was a Christian. Doesn't matter. Child of God. Have mercy on him. Hope that's not all the things that he's done. But you know his life. You know what graces you sent him. Have mercy on him. When he comes to you, when he came to you in judgment, be his advocate. You are his advocate. I'm not asking you to be his advocate, but I want to be his advocate. I pray that when I have to stand before the Lord, those that gain anything or even hear my voice will say Lord have mercy on him take a soft attitude towards him as I know you will because he said that even to the thief on the cross For your kindness to me, for seeing me who I am, 
innocent, at least that. You don't know everything I've done. You don't know what I did in Galilee and Judea and with people and all that. But you saw one thing that the crowd was not telling the truth. The crowd was ranting and raving. Scorning me. But you saw and said and openly said as you died I got what I deserved but this was an innocent man. Lord you made contact. Lord Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, at this moment, let's be united to Jesus. He's opening the door of the kingdom. And the key to opening the door of that kingdom is shaped in the form of a cross. We open it with him. If we don't, let's follow him in. It's a good Friday. So many wonderful things will happen. The evil part will basically end Good Friday. There will be a love and there will be resurrection. I, Jesus, cannot lose. I came to open the gates of heaven and I'm going to open them wide that all of you can come in. You are my sheep. I am the shepherd. The Father sent me to bring you in. Brothers and sisters, let us pray for each other. Through Christ our Lord, because he's the one who makes empty words active.